Hi all, uh, thank you for attending our tutorial on machine learning over static and dynamic uh, relational uh, data. In this tutorial, we will overview recent work on learning over relational data. The main message of this work is that the runtime performance of machine learning can be dramatically improved by a toolbox of both theoretical and systems techniques that exploit the structure and knowledge of the underlying data. Who are we? Uh, we are Ahmed, Dan, Hauge, and Milos. Ahmed is a senior researcher at the University of Zurich. Dan started about a year ago as a full professor and chair for big data science at the University of Zurich. Hauge is a research assistant at the University of Zurich and PhD student at the University of Oxford. And Milos is a lecturer in databases at the University of Edinburgh. Let me say a few uh, words about the, the agenda. So the tutorial has three main parts. In the first part, I will discuss the role of database research in the era of data science. I will set up the scene and explain the current landscape for learning over relational data. The major differentiator between the existing solutions, as we will see, is the degree of integration between the data processor which constructs the training data set from tables and the machine learning algorithm, which trains a desired model over the training data set. The second part is the main technical part of this tutorial. It will discuss a three-step recipe behind the new paradigm for learning over relational data. In the first step, Hauge will show how to turn the ML problem into a database problem. Essentially, he will show how to decouple data intensive computation from uh, the training task and express it as a batch of aggregates. These aggregates are to be computed together over the input database. He will explain this for three cases, for each linear regression, support vector machines, and using mutual information to learn the structure of tree-shaped Bayesian networks, the so-called Cholu trees. In the second step, Ahmed will first overview the toolbox of theoretical development useful for reducing the computational complexity of learning over joints. In particular, he will discuss the algebraic and combinatorial structure present in the data. He will also show examples of how to exploit this structure to lower the complexity of aggregates. Then Milos will show how to systematically exploit the structure for efficient maintenance of aggregates such as those for uh, rich linear regression and mutual information as discussed previously in the static setting by Hao Zhe, but now under data updates. And in the first step, Milos will overview relevant engineering tools that will help reduce the runtime for learning. In particular, he will look at compilation approaches for specific workload and data sets, sharing computation and also parallelization. And the final third part will summarize the lessons of this tutorial and will there look ahead at possible future work. Okay, so we will start with the first part, which is the motivation, and we'll look at database research in the data science area. So there are at least three reasons why database research is empowered by the ongoing data science revolution. Uh, one is the pervasiveness of relational data in data science. The second is the widespread need for efficient data processing, which is fueled in fact by the first reason. Whereas the third is the new processing challenges that are posed by data science workloads that would go beyond the classical database workloads. The first two reasons are widely acknowledged as core to the database community's raison d'etre Whereas the third reason, in my opinion, explains the longevity of relational database management system success. Uh, whenever a new promising data-centric technology surfaces, research is underway to show that it can be captured naturally by variations or extensions of the existing relational techniques. These reasons are also behind the work overviewed in this tutorial. So the first reason I mentioned before was the pervasiveness of relational data in data science. According to a fairly recent Kaggle survey, uh, most data scientists use relational data at work. Relational data 
is in fact the most prevalent form of used data reported in that survey. This is particularly the case for various industries such as retail, marketing, insurance, and finance. Now, given the pervasiveness of relational data, one would expect there are specific relational-based techniques for learning over relational data. This is, however, not the case. Uh, the state of affairs in learning over relational data is rather far from satisfactory. Consider a simplified scenario in which we'd like to train a model over a database in the retail domain. We'll first compute the training data set using a so-called feature extraction query, which joins together the different relations in the input data set and possibly throws away relevant columns and possibly may add new columns representing aggregated features. This data set, which is depicted here to the right, tends to be orders of magnitude larger than the original database. Then the machine learning tool gets this training data set as input and produces the model we want. I call this approach structure agnostic learning um, because uh, once the training data is constructed, the information about the relational structure, such as various types of constraints and dependencies are thrown away and disregarded in the subsequent process of learning the model. And this comes with several shortcomings for this approach. The first one is that it materializes the data matrix. And this may take, in fact, no trivial time, as you'll see shortly in an example. Second, in typical cases, the data is moved between the query processor and the machine learning tool. This, again, may take non trivial time. Third, the one hot encoding creates very wide matrices that blur the typical database distinction between schema sizes and data sizes. Fourth, after training the model, any changes to the input data in the form of uh, uh, updates like tupling sessions or deletions or schema changes or additions of new tables would require retraining from scratch. And fifth, this approach would inherit the limitations of both the query processor and the machine learning tool. For instance, the maximum data size in R is much less than typical database sizes. And similarly, the maximum number of columns in Postgres can be much less than the number of model features. Now, an alternative approach to structure agnostic learning is the structure aware learning. It is depicted here in blue at the bottom, is this part. Instead of materializing the result of the feature extraction query, we instead compose this query with the aggregates that are needed by the learning algorithm to create a batch of aggregate queries that are to be evaluated over the join of the input relations. Haoge will show you later the type of aggregates for the different learning tasks. They are needed, for instance, to compute cost functions or gradients. The result of this batch of aggregates can be much smaller than the input database. Its result is then taken as input to the optimization step. For instance, a gradient descent algorithm or an algorithm to compute decision trees like CART. And then we produce the model parameters. In this sense, we largely transform the machine learning task into a database problem whose workload now is the efficient evaluation of batches of aggregates. Given the nature of these aggregates, this workload can be seen as a new workload that asks for new evaluation techniques. The prototypical uh, structure agnostic approach, which is actually the most widespread approach, is to exhibit no integration whatsoever between the query processor, where the feature extraction query is executed, and the machine learning task. The good aspects of this would be that most uh, uh, database and uh, machine learning solutions would operate in this space and would support virtually any machine learning task because it will keep the two processors separated so we can use full-fledged uh, mature systems. Yeah? So both then the machine learning and the database uh, 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 systems would be distinct tools on the technology stack. The bad, of course, is that we have no uh, structure aware learning here. In particular, the, the shortcomings I mentioned before are prevalent in this approach. And examples here would be Postgres uh, combined with R, for instance, 
or in uh, Jupyter notebooks, uh, we can have pandas combined with scikit-learn or with TensorFlow, or we can have distributed solutions such as Spark SQL combined with the machine learning uh, 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 tool called MLlib, and there are many others. Uh, a step forward uh, towards uh, uh, structure-aware uh, learning is provided by a so-called loose integration. Here, uh, what we see is that uh, some code uh, for the machine learning task is moved inside the database system. And uh, while it remains structure agnostic, uh, nevertheless, this approach uh, uh, addresses uh, some of the drawbacks of purely structured agnostic uh, learning. Namely, now inside the database, we have user-defined functions that support the machine learning tasks. Now we have uh, the same running process for both the database and the machine learning. And uh, there is absolutely no data export of the database system and import into the machine learning tool uh, because everything runs within the same space. So the database would compute one table and then the machine learning uh, uh, well presented as user-defined functions will work directly on it. And prime examples here would be Madlib, which would support a comprehensive library of machine learning uh, user-defined functions, and Bismarck, which uh, gives a unified uh, programming architecture for incremental uh, gradient uh, descent. Now, uh, prototypical structure-aware learning would uh, consider a very tight integration of the data processor and the machine learning task. Uh, this is, in fact, not a new idea. Uh, Choudhury in 98 already looked at this uh, paradigm in the context of mining, and in particular for so-called in-database mining. And there, the, the considerations was given to uh, uh, frequent items and mining for association rules that could be done with logic that resides inside the database uh, uh, processor. Um, in the in the in the newer space of machine learning over databases, um, we mentioned uh, systems such as Orion and Hamlet that support learning of uh, generalized linear models and naive bias over star schemas with key foreign key joints. From uh, my FDB group, then uh, we have uh, systems such as LMFAO, which uh, supports uh, polynomial regression models factorization machines, decision trees, uh, principal component analysis, and k-means clustering, amongst others. And uh, this system builds on prior efforts uh, for linear regression over continuous variables uh, in the system called F, or the system ACDC that looked at uh, a subset of the, of the models uh, considered now, such as factorization machines and PCA. Now, uh, a different tool this time for supporting machine learning under uh, data updates uh, would be FIVM. And Milos will discuss uh, in a greater depth about uh, the, the, the abilities of FIVM. And later on, under uh, system tools, we will touch on IFAQ, uh, which is a system to, that automatically identifies and optimizes uh, machine learning uh, uh, and uh, database uh, programs, that is hybrid machine learning and databases. Good, so uh, having seen the landscape, um, uh, then, um, and thinking about the structure aware versus structure agnostic approaches, uh, the main conjecture posed by the community when, they when, when we first started looking into the problem of learning over relational data, was uh, uh, whether the learning time and accuracy of the model can be drastically improved by exploiting the structure and semantics of the underlying multi-relational database. And uh, as the following simple experiment shows, uh, they were not far off from the truth. Uh, so consider for now uh, this simplified database from one of the uh, retail clients of, uh, of a company we worked with uh, in the past. Uh, it contains information about items sold in stores on specific dates, the demographics of the store locations, the weather of the uh, on the considered dates, and the inventory, that is, how many units of each item do we have at any one time. The database has roughly two gigabytes in size, 
And we consider here the natural key for the join of the relations as the feature extraction query. As we can see here, this join is about 10 times larger than the input database. So in fact, our training data set would be of that uh, size. So in our experiment, we'd like to train a rich linear regression model to predict inventory given all available features in the join result. Uh, a structure agnostic solution would first compute the training data set as the natural join. Uh, here we use the Postgres and then we train the model here using, uh, post, uh, uh, using TensorFlow. So as we can see, the join takes over 150 seconds to produce 23 gigabytes of data. Then exporting the data would take about double this time. From that point on, TensorFlow would take over. It shuffles the data first, uh, for which it needs about uh, uh, 5,000 seconds. Then it runs a variant of stochastic gradient descent, which for one epoch, that is one pass over the data, needs over 7,000 seconds. So in total, this approach needs over 13,000 seconds. And here the lion's share of this processing time is taken by TensorFlow. Now to train the same model with a slightly better accuracy, a structural aware approach called the uh, uh, LMFAO would only need six seconds. So it computes the query batch consisting of about 800 aggregates over the same natural join in slightly over six seconds. Their results take about 37 kilobytes. So this is much less than the input database size and way less than the join on which the structured agnostic approach would have to work. So this approach then uses a plain batch gradient descent to compute the model parameters using the result of these aggregates. So think of these aggregates as being coefficients of the model parameters in the uh, uh, gradient descent uh, update uh, rule. And this takes much less than a second, right? So once the aggregate batch is uh, computed, any model over a subset of the available features would take about one second to compute. Overall, we can see that LMFAO can take significantly less time and uh, within the same time budget that would be, let's say, allocated to Postgres plus TensorFlow, uh, it can be used to train more, many more models, right? And to investigate a larger space of possible models. It also allows us to keep the models fresh. Yeah. Now, TensorFlow, uh, uh, the behavior of TensorFlow and Postgres we see here is the rule and not the exception. So this behavior was noticed for a variety of data sets and systems and models. Uh, with this, we can in fact conclude that uh, it's rather the rule, as I said, uh, and not the exception of what we noticed in the previous uh, simple uh, experiment. Yeah. And um, a major question now is how to achieve this performance improvement? This is a very important question uh, that uh, we will aim to answer in the remaining part of the tutorial. But before we get there, let me know if there are any questions to the first part of the tutorial. Thank you.